Okay. Are we ready to do this? I think we're ready to do this. Does everything look good? Sound looks good. Music's good. Browsers are good. Everything looks good. All right, I think we're ready to go. So let's get rid of that. There it goes. And hello, Shadowcat back. And today we are going to be talking about something not political, not social, not cultural. We're going to be taking something just kind of, kind of light and easy today. Mostly because this is kind of my time to vent and, oh boy, do I have something to vent about. So, uh, yeah, that's going to happen. Oh, one thing I forgot to do is I've got to bring, bring up my chat. Pop out chat. See, I knew I was going to forget something. It was inevitable. There we go. And increase the size so I can actually read it. There we go. There's my chat. All right, so earlier this week, I was sent a, a news article. Well, not news, but I was sent a, a, an article, an opinion article from PC Gamer Magazine. And in general, I wouldn't give PC Gamer Magazine the time of day. However, I have a great love in me for all things tabletop. I love Dungeons and Dragons. I love Pathfinder, Shadowrun, Call of Cthulhu, um, just all those things. And even the bigger ones, like I love Warhammer, or Battletech, you know, you know, whatever. I love tabletop games. They're great. I love games in general, but tabletop games are really special, especially the role-playing ones. Mostly because of their just absolutely boundless, unlimited potential, which you've seen some of if you come to my Sunday streams where I work on different modules to turn games like Pathfinder into completely other games using the same rules. So far, we have done Star Trek. We've done The Wheel of Time. We're currently working on Final Fantasy. These games have a lot of potential in them. However, the reason why tabletop games were for the longest time regarded as the nerd game is because they are an intellectual game. And you have to be of at least a certain level of knowledgeability and just practical application of intelligence to really get the most out of them. And this is never more obvious than when somebody fails to get the point. Now we saw a big pushback against this when it comes to Dungeons and Dragons. Because with Dungeons and Dragons, for the longest time, the staple of all tabletop games was Dungeons and Dragons version 3.5. 3.0 in general, but 3.5 is when it was just chef's kiss. It was wonderful. It was so wonderful that basically when Pathfinder came out, they more or less copied D&D 3.5 wholesale and then just said, this is good, let's make it better. And so it was, it was better. And it still is. I see Tuxedo's in the chat. Good morning, Tuxedo, good to see you here. So anyway, the problem comes in that you can only sell the same thing for so long. After all, it's not like you're selling food where people have to come back and get more food. Or, you know, consumable things like toilet paper or napkins or stuff like that. Once you have sold everybody the books, they have the books. Now you have to either make more books and expand your setting, or sooner or later you're going to have to just update your game. And so they did. And, oh boy, did they. They, uh, they made Dungeons & Dragons 4th Edition. <clears throat> A little bit of history on this one. When Dungeons & Dragons first came out, Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition, the game was, in some ways, less complicated, in other ways, more complicated. The fact of the matter was that 
Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition was not very expansive. Now, that doesn't say that it, it couldn't be expansive. It was. There was a lot to do in it, but a lot of it came down to just your imagination. Here are some basic rules for how things go. You're going to have to make up the rest. There was a large emphasis on making your own stuff and then trying to fit it into the, the rules that you had. For example, they didn't really give a whole lot of specifications when it came to swords. Sure, there were larger swords or smaller swords, but basically when it came to swords, you either had the one-handed sword or the two-handed sword. Or maybe you would just have a dagger or a knife. Okay, so there, those were your blade options. Or you could have an axe, which would be one-handed or two-handed. Or a hammer, one-handed, two-handed. You get the idea. There wasn't the great list of different swords that you had right now because they were all treated basically the same. So again, first edition, not as expansive. At the, at the same time though, the details. Because when it came to first edition, they wanted you to keep track of everything. Not only was your character either male or female, which changed how your character's stats would go, but your height mattered, your weight mattered, and when I say it mattered, we'll get to that in a minute. Every detail of your character had significance. The details of your character were significant, whether you had brown hair, or you had gold eyes, or whatever it was. You had to keep track of which hand was your dominant hand, which foot was your dominant foot. It was a lot. And it was very detailed, and when it came to things like grappling, that is where it came to both shine and curse the game. Because when you had to take into the into account, every five pounds that you have on your opponent changes the roll by this much. Every inch that they have on you changes things as much. Which hand are you using as your primary grappling hand? Is it your primary hand or your off hand? Which leg are you dominant with? It got super complicated, and nobody liked it. But it was still popular enough that people would, they would get through it, and D&D would come to be a, a huge hit. And then, we got to... Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. Otherwise known as Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition. And that's where they said, Dungeons & Dragons is good. But can we make it better? And so they changed the entire game. And when I say they changed the entire game, I mean they changed the entire game. In some respects, you can put Dungeons & Dragons 1, 2, and 3 together, and 2 does not even look like the same game. For example, the most prominent example, and the most divisive one, was Thacko. And if you're unfamiliar with that, FACO is an acronym. It is T-H-A-C-0, which of course is short for to hit armor class 0. So what would happen is you would have a basic armor class, usually about 10. And then every time you would get a bonus from your armor, it would take away from that 10 number and move you towards 0. Ironically enough, in Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, your best armor class would have been a negative number. And they were easily possible because with some good dexterity, some decent armor, maybe a couple of spells, you could easily push your armor class below zero. And then they would have to roll to hit it, but here's where things got confusing. All of your attack bonuses were bonuses. You added them to the roll. And so then you were trying to roll the positive numbers against your negative numbers. It was bad. Nobody liked it. Okay, I take that back. A few people really did like it. Those people are weird. Most people did not like it. And that was evident when we got to Dungeons & Dragons 3rd Edition because that all went away. We went back to the normal additive armor class of 
I get to start with an armor class where I get to roll my armor class and then I get to add bonuses on top of it. And that was so good that it became the mainstay of basically everything and we never looked back. However, this is where things kind of go downhill. And that is that, again, as I said, after Dungeons & Dragons 3.5 had been around forever, they said, well, what are we going to do next? And of course, their answer was the same thing in first edition. They said, what if we make it better? And so they changed the entire game. And thus we got Dungeons & Dragons 4th edition, otherwise known as Dungeons & Dragons for Dummies. Because they took all the systems that were in Dungeons & Dragons 3.5, all the expansive charts that you had, the long lists of spells, you had this incredibly long list of feats and skills, and they said, get rid of it. We need to make a new Dungeons & Dragons for everybody. And Tuck says there's a furry in the bottom right corner of the screen. Cat is trying to furry us. Look, you knew what you were getting into when you got into a live stream with somebody named Cat. Also, that's the background music. If you don't like the background music, I don't know, complain some more. Maybe it'll work. I like this video. It's nine hours long. It's easy for me to use, and it's supposed to be copyright free. Anyway, as I was saying, fourth edition. They just said, we're going to try and make the Dungeons and Dragons for everybody. We want any idiot off the street to be able to come in here, pick up Dungeons and Dragons fourth edition, pick up a character sheet and play. And while I can understand wanting to do that, one of the things that made Dungeons and Dragons so delightful was its complexity. The fact is that when you got into 3.5, it took the imagination of first edition and gave it an expansive rule set where you could adapt almost any thought that you wanted into the game. As I've said, I've been doing this on my Sunday streams with Pathfinder, which was based off of D&D 3.5, where we can take the systems they have in place there and adapt anything to it. Currently, we're working on a Final Fantasy uh, module. And I can take something like, say, a Fyra or Firaga spell from Final Fantasy and adapt that through the magic system of, say, a Fireball. A Fireball deals 66 damage over a certain area. A Fyra or Firaga spell is a much smaller area, so I can up the damage a little bit and I can adapt one to the other. This was the benefit. It meant that you could take the stats from one sword and apply it to another. For example, if you wanted to play as a samurai in, in Dungeons & Dragons, well, before they had samurai and ninja and all of the eastern flavor there, you would have to just kind of homebrew your own. So how would you do that? Well... Dungeons & Dragons has many armors. However, none of them are Eastern. It has things like chain armor or plate armor. But it also has things like hide armor. In Japan, because they did not have the vast stores of metal at their disposal, they did not make their armor out of metal generally. Their armor tended to be lamellar which is to say that it was usually made out of laminated sheets of paper and hide. And then those layers, th those layered pieces, would then be overlapped into the traditional um, armor that we see now. I want to say Testudo armor, but I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm, I'm not as familiar with it. I want to... Kabuto is the helmet. I want to say the armor is Testudo, but I'm not positive. Anyway... If you've ever seen a samurai, you know the armor I'm talking about. It just looks like overlapping scales. That's generally made out of paper and hide. And sometimes lacquered just to make it a little bit stronger. So you would take something like maybe hide armor or chain armor, and then you would just rename it to be that. And for your katana, 
You would take a lower power sword because katanas tended to be a little weaker than something like the European long sword. However, because it has a much more generous cutting angle and, and it's easier to use, you would make its critical range a little bit better. Somewhat the same as taking, say, a short sword, but giving it the critical range of a rapier. By combining those, you now had your katana, and you could use the rules you already had to make whatever you wanted. There was a, a delightful complexity to it that allowed you to really expand your horizons. Fourth edition, however, did not have that. Tuxedo says, uh, D&D 4E, as I understand, was supposed to be simplified for online play, but they never got to the online part. You are actually wrong about that. Not necessarily the first part, but the second part, because there is a game called Neverwinter Online. Yeah, Neverwinter Online, which is based on Dungeons and Dragons 4th Edition. It's made by the same people who did Champions Online and Star Trek Online. So I think it's currently owned by Gearbox. But either way, it's based on 4th edition, and you are absolutely right. They wanted to boil it down into something so simple that it basically required no thought. This is where we began to see the introduction of things like sequences in Dungeons & Dragons. If you're unfamiliar with that term, sequences are an MMO term for the order in which your skills are meant to be used. Which is to say that, let's take Guild Wars 2 for example. Guild Wars 2 is a good example because it uses sequences. And in Guild Wars 2, when you pick up a weapon, if it's a two-handed weapon, it takes up your first five abilities. The first one, of course, is your auto attack. It does a little bit of damage, and sometimes it inflicts status abilities. Your second is usually going to be a harder attack that may also inflict status abilities. Your third, however, usually, sometimes your fourth, sometimes your fifth, but your third is usually something that will inflict a status effect that your second can take advantage of. To give an example, your second ability may be just a... Let's say it's a, um, a gouge with a dagger. Not actually an attack, it's an example though. But maybe it's a gouge with a dagger, okay? So, like, you would stab somebody and just rip with it. Well, in order to do that, you might get some extra extra damage out of it and maybe inflict the bleeding if your target was already inflicted with vulnerability. So what would your third op or third attack do? It would inflict the vulnerability you needed, thereby allowing you to use your second attack, make the slash, and inflict the bleeding. Sequences. Use this, then this, then this. And this is what 4th edition basically did. It took the large array of abilities that you would have and all the synergies therein and just kind of boiled them down into a few attacks that would be intentionally generated to synergize with each other. And then you would simply be instructed, these are what your abilities do. To best use these abilities, go ahead and just... Use this into this, this one into this one, and finish it off with this. This is great for the average person who doesn't know anything about Dungeons & Dragons. But it's terrible for the actual players who had been dealing with these complex systems forever and who had found comfort in the ability to just make whatever character they wanted. Now, suddenly, if they wanted to make that samurai... They couldn't, because the options didn't exist. If you wanted to make your samurai now, and use the abilities that these samurais had, you would either have to very generously rename one of the abilities that was still in there, or you would have to make your own house rules. And while this is not something that's impossible to do, it's also not great. You want to have a way to balance everything, and so being able to use the rules that are already in the game is your method to make sure that everything works. Nothing is underpowered, nothing is overpowered. And so 4th edition 
really didn't do very well. Everybody agreed that 4th edition was kind of trash. And so we moved on from it. They kept the things that worked, and they then tried to expand upon those things. And thus we got Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. 5th edition came out and said, we understand that people didn't like 4, we're trying to fix the things that people didn't like. And thus they went ahead and they greatly expanded the game again. They said, you want options? We'll give you options. You want flexibility? We'll give you flexibility. But they didn't do it in the right way. See, in Dungeons & Dragons 3rd Edition, you were given these vast arrays of feats, and you were told, when you make your character, you get to pick a feat. And every odd-numbered level after that, you get another feat. It was very simple. And you could really customize your character based upon the feats you had. Would you like to be a swashbuckling, two-sorted pirate? Then pick up feats for two-handed? Pick up feats for agility? Because, you know, if you're going to be on the rocking deck of a ship, there you go. Do what you want. Fifth edition, however, took that in a different direction and said, Would you like to be a pirate? We have made a pirate for you. This is a fighter template or a rogue template, or a bard template, whatever it happens to be. This is a pirate. This is what the things are going to be for your pirate character, and these are the feats that you're going to get as you level up. It took all the choice out of it, it took all the variety out of it, and just said, Here, we made you a pirate. People like pirates, right? Would you like to be a ninja? That's going to be a rogue. And it just follow the rogue archetype here. So now you have a ninja. You didn't get to actually build it yourself. You just said, this is what I want to play, and they handed it to you. And so in that way, they did expand the ideas of what you could do. But at the same time, they also took all the choice and all the thought away from you as well. It was a false choice. You didn't actually gain anything from it. And that was only one example of the things that they simplified in 5e. One of the things that got simplified, they started doing this in 4e and they carried it over to 5e. And it is the subject of today's video, <clears throat> is the alignment system. And we're going to get into this in depth, in detail. But I wanted to give this a little bit of a background on Dungeons & Dragons so we all had a firm foundation to start from. And we're going to do a lot of reading today, so bear with me. So here's the article that we're working from, and we may lose our little furry dude in the corner when I switch windows. So this is an article that came out five days ago from this Robin Valentine who works at PC Gamer. And as I put it, tell me that you don't play um, Dungeons & Dragons without telling me you don't play Dungeons & Dragons, because this is an entire article on completely missing the point. Obviously, Baldur's Gate 3 is either out or it's coming out soon, I'm not sure. I can't afford to get it. If you want me to get it, though, I have a Patreon. Because I, I wouldn't mind it. I have had some requests for uh, to play it on the channel, and it's just like, I, I can't do that right now, unfortunately. But, here's what he says. I'm so relieved... Well, he or she, I can't tell. Robin could go either way. Whatever. I'm so relieved Baldur's Gate 3 doesn't have D&D's alignment system. Without lawful good and chaotic evil, Larian is free to give us more nuanced moral choices. And right there, right there, tells you pretty much everything that you need to know about this person. Because they seem to believe that with, if you have a lawful good or a chaotic evil person, suddenly, nuance just went out the window. Right there is your first clue. But let's read on. D&D alignments suck. There, I said it. They suck in every edition of the tabletop game, but they particularly suck in D&D video games. What a relief to hear Baldur's Gate 3 isn't using them at all. Okay. Right here. There's a big disconnect 
that we need to talk about. So D&D alignments suck. No, they don't. And I'm going to explain why not later. But they particularly suck in D&D video games. See, this is the point right here. One of the things that we need to really address is the difference between the tabletop game and a video game. I have been a dungeon master for a very long time, and I'm hoping that once my life is more stable, I'm able to do this again. But one, every dungeon master has their own forte. There is no one who's just good at everything. Some dungeon masters really, really excel at world building. They will spend literally weeks to months crafting their perfect world. They will make elaborate maps, and then they will fill those maps with cities and people, legends, lore, religions, politics, major figures. They will create a world that you might want to just go live in because it is that detailed and that finely crafted. Others are particularly good when it comes to things like combat, where they're able to run these massive campaigns. We're talking like the Battle of Five Armies from The Hobbit, or the Battle at um, Mordor, where Sauron fell from The Lord of the Rings. Some are really good at combat, and they're capable of managing many different pawns on the field and making it all work. Myself, I'm good at adaptation. My worlds are not nearly as rich as somebody who might spend weeks crafting their world. And I actually borrow pretty heavily from Warhammer when it comes to combat because I try to make my combat flow better instead of making it necessarily authentic to Dungeons & Dragons. But what I'm good at is adapting on the fly to whatever people want. See, the world builder will have a really hard time if your NPC, or if your party says, I want to go this way. Well, if they're on the road, and you have a, this elaborate plot lined up for them when they get to the next mile, or the next city, or whatever, you might not be prepared for if they just take a random left turn. And the same thing goes for the combat specialist. If you're just not really that well equipped to handle a random turn, you might struggle with that. Me, I'm actually really good at that. Because if you feel like taking a left turn off the road and just trekking through the forest, I can generate anything else you want. That's my strength. And that's something that I can do in a tabletop game. But a video game, a video game has all the time in the world to really craft its world. The developers can take as much time as they want, as much time as they need to, to make sure that everything is there. And a computer can handle combat no problem. You can have hundreds of people on the battlefield, and the computer can handle it. But what they can't do is adapt, because the video game is limited by its code. A video game cannot make a snap decision. It cannot handle a hypothetical. Video games do not have what we would call, as we saw up here, nuance. They're not more nuanced. They are very rigid. Because a program cannot adapt. And Tuck says they will create a world for a world you want to live in. Or maybe visit for a vacation or a nightmare hellscape you only want to enter with the ability to actually feel pain, or without the ability to feel pain from it. I mean, that is all true. But yeah, games cannot change. They don't have the ability to grow beyond what they have been programmed to do. That is something that this person does not understand. Moving on. For those unfamiliar, alignment is a sort of objective label for a D&D character's morality. This is not technically untrue. Different editions have had different categories of alignment, but the one used most widely across the editions rates characters along an axis of lawful or chaotic and good or evil. 
A lawful good char character is kind and just, and always follows the laws of the land as much as possible. That is wrong. But we'll get to that. A chaotic evil character follows their dark heart's desire, inflicting death and suffering whenever they wish. That is also technically wrong. That would be more what we would call chaotic stupid, but we'll get to that. Characters can be neutral on one or, more, or one or both axes too. A chaotic neutral character believes in freedom and self-determination above all. A true neutral, neutral to both character, seeks balance in all things. That is also not necessarily true. It can be true, but not necessarily. A neutral good character devotes themselves to... Uh, we'll, get, we'll get back to me on that one. Really. We'll get back to that easily enough. As I stated before, this person is a midwit. They think they know what they're talking about. They have absolutely no idea. It's a system that held on for a long time because of nostalgia and tradition. But it's always been awkward and reductive. It's restrictive enough to stifle nuanced character development, but vague enough that you probably are already getting angry at me about my interpretation of one of the alignments above. Oh, don't worry. We're well beyond that at this point. I'm so angry at you that I've already come full circle to calm again. It's led to decades of idiotic arguments about the ethics of fantasy worlds. D&D's version of, would you go back in time and kill Hitler as a baby? Is, is it lawful good for a paladin to kill a chaotic evil baby orc? A hypothetical both incredibly tiresome and infuriatingly actually relevant to gameplay. There's a lot to unpack there. So a system that has held on for a long time because of nostalgia and tradition but it's always been awkward and reductive. Now, if you've ever been to my other lectures, I have talked about progressivism, I've talked about leftism, okay? Because we see it present in all facets of society. And this is the one point that I'm actually going to get very political in this discussion, because when we talk about leftism and progressivism, this is the argument that we always hear. Argu nostalgia and tradition, bad. Because it's just bad. It's awkward and reductive. How is it awkward and reductive? It's not. But they don't care about this. Because they think they're better. No, it's not nostalgic and or nostalgia and tradition. There's a good reason for it. But you actually have to have a functioning brain to understand it. And Blizz is in the chat. Hello, Blizz. As far as the um, the ethics argument of would you go back in time to kill Hitler as a baby, is it lawful good for a paladin to kill a chaotic evil baby orc? The answer to that is no, and I will explain that later. It is not tiresome, it's actually a very good question, and any person who actually believes in asking questions and debate would not find that tiresome. However, that would also require a certain level of thinking that this person is incapable of. Let's move on. That's because in many of D&D's editions, alignment has been baked into the key rules of the game. It could restrict what class you could be. At one point, all druids had to be true neutral, for example. It could affect what spells you could cast, or what effects certain spells would have on you. In the case of paladins, straying from lawful good could lose you access to your class abilities, turning you into just a guy in inappropriately shiny armor, which is why so many of them ended up in lengthy philosophical arguments with their dungeon masters. Okay. First off, it is true that once upon a time, druids had to be true neutral. That has since been rectified. Druids still have to be neutral, but they can be a neutral. As far as the paladins go, however, straying too far from lawful good? Well, let me ask you this. Because before you even get to this, this question here, answer this. You are a paladin. You must have a god. How can you have a god who is anything other than lawful good 
if you yourself must be lawful good? How could you have a chaotic good, God, if you were a paladin? How could you have a lawful neutral, God, if you were a paladin? And if you answer that question, the rest of these questions become meaningless. We'll come back to this because lengthy philosophical arguments with your dungeon master, if you have to have a lengthy philosophical argument with your dungeon master over your paladin's alignment, then either you have misunderstood your paladin or you have a bad dungeon master because this should not be lengthy or philosophical. It could be, but it shouldn't be. In a video game, there isn't even a DM to argue with. The developers have frequently struggled to implement alignment in a satisfying way. The nature of the system means games have to try to cover an absurd range of possible character viewpoints in their dialogue choices, and more often than not, the result has been awkward and artificial moral choices. This part I will actually agree with. Because if you're making the game, how do you possibly cater to every possible outcome. You can't. Yet. That's actually very interesting because with the onset of AI, we are coming to a point where a game with an AI inside of it could actually deal with questions like this. We're not there yet, but we're getting close. For example, thanks for rescuing my cat from the tree adventure. Here's your 100 gold reward, and your options are thrice. Lawful good, think nothing of it, citizen, and please, keep the gold. Or neutral, you're welcome, thanks for the gold, or chaotic evil. I, got, I only got your cat down so I could murder it. And you! Oh, and I'm taking the gold as well. It's just not a flexible system for building nuanced and interesting choices around. And a big reason for that is because it's not a good reflection on how morality works, in the real world or in fiction. People simply don't fit into such neat categories. Worse, alignment for a long time has baked some seriously wrong, seriously uncomfortable implications into D&D's world building. Here's a problem with this, this whole argument, though. Let's go up to his argument, okay? He wants to talk about moral. Oh, and Tuck says, wouldn't lawful be to accept the gold? Technically speaking, yes, it would be. And that shows that you are actually a big brain person, unlike the guy who wrote this. But let's look at this, okay? Thanks for rescuing my cat from the tree. Here's a hundred gold reward. If we're going to talk about morals, and we're going to talk about nuance, and how we don't have enough expanse, we don't have enough options here, what other options would you like here? So would you like to have an option to also, say, think of nothing and also take the gold? Well, that's option number two. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, or here, you're welcome, and here's the gold. Thank you for the gold. Okay, we've already got that covered. What else do we want? Um, I only got your cat down so I could murder it, and you? So, would you like to have a chaotic neutral option where you murder the cat but don't murder the owner? Would you like one where they say lawful evil, where they then they get the cat down? And then they extort them, saying, give me double the gold, or I murder your cat. How many more options do you really want here? And are any of these options a different morality than what you're looking for? If you hurt the cat or the owner in any way, there is almost nobody in existence who is not an absolute psychopath who is going to argue that you have not done an evil action. So morality here is already set. However, if you went up to rescue the cat in the first place, you have already done a good action. Do you know what the neutral action here would have been? Nothing. Because as it turns out, as they mentioned earlier, 
Neutral is sometimes seeking an absolute balance in all things. But do you know what neutral is also? Apathy. A true neutral character may not do anything unless it affects them in some way. Meaning that a true neutral character who is being presented with this issue might just ignore the person and keep walking. Was that an option? Technically speaking, it was. You didn't have to start this dialogue in the game, you could have walked right by the NPC. Now, if the NPC prompted you by starting the encounter when you walked within a certain range, you could add a separate option or just replace the second option with, I don't care. So this is a, this is a bad argument to begin with. And this is a bad analysis. When you say that certain kinds of sapient beings are inherently good or evil from birth, whether you realize it or not, you're making a pretty weird statement about right and wrong in your setting, particularly in conjunction with D&D's historic use of the word race instead of species, it's long drifted uncomfortably close to real-world discriminatory ideas that see certain groups in society as having innately negative traits while others are born superior. And here again is where we see the progressive leftism leaking into the culture. Because what they're basically doing is they're making the same argument that Wizards of the Coast accepted a long time ago, that orcs are somehow equivalent to black people. This is something that literally no person who ever played Dungeons and Dragons ever thought about. But these people, who literally have to see every single thing in the world as some kind of race issue, gender issue, whatever, because their progressive lens will not let them look at anything as anything other than a problem to be fixed, they have to make everything racist, everything sexist, everything homophobic, and they have to point it out in the paraphrased words of Anita Sarkeesian. The thing is, Dungeons & Dragons has always allowed you to make whatever character you want. And when it comes to making an entire race, and I'm going to use the word race here, good or evil, it wasn't actually a commentary on any individual person. It was a commentary on that culture. Now, is an orc evil? The answer to that is no. Orcs are, generally speaking, not evil. They're also not necessarily good. They're not necessarily evil. Orcs are individuals. But when we look at orcs as NPCs, we're not necessarily looking at the orc as an individual. We're looking at the orc as one part of a whole. And so we're not talking about the entire race of orcs. We're talking about orcs as a culture. As a culture, what do orcs do? They are not agricultural. They are not ranchers, okay? They don't necessarily always keep livestock. What do orcs as a culture do? They tend to be raiders, pillagers, and enslavers. Why? Because that's how orcs have made their living for however many years you want to go back in fantasy history, it's how they still make their living today. Now, does that mean that if you see an orc and you automatically assume that it's probably from a culture that pillages and raids and steals, are you stereotyping that orc? Yes. You are stereotyping that orc. However, let us not forget why stereotypes exist in the first place. You can't stereotype something with something that has never ever been true, then you're just lying about them. Now granted, if you lie about somebody enough, if you lie about a group enough and the lie becomes pervasive, that can become a stereotype. But generally speaking, most stereotypes show up because a culture has 
express that. To give a really easy example, Romani people, otherwise called gypsies, don't have them over here in North America. However, they're very common over in Europe, and the Romani have a very nasty stereotype of being thieves. The unfortunate part for them, however, is that that stereotype is not unearned. Because the Romani people have been nomadic since forever, and since sometimes, if you're a nomad, things get really rough, the Romani people have resorted to theft a lot. It is literally a part of their culture, one that they don't want to talk about, but one that almost anyone will admit to if you were to sit down and have a conversation about the history of the Romani people. Now, does that mean that every Romani is a thief? Of course not. I would dare say most of them aren't. I don't know, I've never met them. But in general, most people are not thieves. The stereotype, however, remains because it is true to an extent. And so when we talk in fantasy settings, are orcs generally going to be evil or at least stereotyped as evil? Yes. Are elves going to be stereotyped as being aloof and pompous? Yes. Are dwarves going to be stereotyped as being industrious? Yes. They're all stereotypes. But what makes one stereotype better than another? Can you not be a grounded elf? Can you not be a lazy dwarf? If we're going to talk about the problems in one stereotype, we can talk about the problems in the rest of them. But the problem here is not that the stereotype exists. It's that you're worried about where it's being applied. You're worried about being applied to the individual and not the culture. The culture is what the stereotype is applied to. The individuals can be different, which is something that I've tried to express to players in all of my games. You don't need to play into the stereotype. Every barbarian does not have to be an orc. Every ranger does not have to be an elf. Every fighter does not have to be a dwarf. You are free to do whatever you want. And JP's in the chat. Hello, JP. When you make your characters and when your DM makes NPCs, they can always buck the trend. And they often do, after all. Orcs, or at least orcish culture, tends to be raiding and pillaging. But if you come across a trader, maybe a, a wandering merchant, and they happen to be an orc, do you expect that orc to just simply grab a battle axe and try to massacre you? Well, of course not. It's a merchant. See, these are the nuances that come into Dungeons & Dragons that this person has missed. In every case, you can have a wizard orc, or you can have a fighter elf, or you can have a bard dwarf. And your stats can always reflect that. You can have an elf with low dexterity. You can have an orc with high intelligence. And you can have a dwarf with high charisma. That's where the nuance is. And that's where this person just completely glossed over everything. Why? Because they don't want to see it. As I pointed out, when you look at this and you see that their, their inclusion on how applying these labels to sapient beings makes it uncomfortable. Yeah. It's uncomfortable because they're making it uncomfortable, because they're looking to be uncomfortable, and they're trying to make the game fit into their discomfort so they can then blame the game for them feeling uncomfortable because it gives them some reason to write this and get paid. Because let's not forget, this person got paid to write this. I'm getting paid my Patreon to review it. He got paid a lot more than I did. The difference is, though, I'm right and they're wrong. And I will go to my grave on that statement. In the real world, right and wrong are messy, subjective, and much argued over. Right there in the first sentence, right and wrong are messy, subjective, and argued over. 
No, they're not. The majority, the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of people agree on what is right and what is wrong. How do I know this? Because we have laws. We have societies where we have agreed on what is right and what is wrong. And just because you buck the trend on what you think is right and wrong doesn't mean that you're right and society is now suddenly wrong. No. No, it just means that you disagree. But this is where we see the superior narcissism in the progressive left. No, right and wrong are objective. They are objective because we as a culture, as a people, have agreed that we believe that certain things are right and wrong. We believe that lying is wrong. Stealing is wrong. We believe that murder is wrong. We believe that violence, in most cases, is wrong. I say most because there are cases where it is the right thing to do. But there has to be a justification for that. Unjustified violence is wrong. These are not subjective. This is very much objective. We all agree. But we have to understand that the person writing this is going to be one of those people who think that, say, stealing is not wrong. If you need it. This is going to be a person who's going to argue that, you know, the mass theft, the mass shoplifting in places like California is actually a good thing because these people are getting the supplies that they need, despite the fact that it is literally destroying entire cities. I saw a graph uh, earlier this week. Apparently, the entire tourism industry in San Francisco is down by like 33%. Meaning that all those businesses that relied on tourism, like the hotel businesses, yeah, um, they're also down by 33% or more. No, this is not subjective. And there's really no argument here to be made. We can have the argument. But you don't have one to make. By making good and evil literal, objective forces that every character is touched by, you then have to make some pretty sweeping decisions about what is always good and what is always evil. If orcs are born evil, does that mean that good people should strive to wipe them out completely? Yes? Great! Now our light-hearted fantasy world is pro-genocide. Where do I even begin with that absolutely ridiculous pile of filth that they managed to splatter onto a website? As I pointed out, we talk about these alignments, we talk about the general acceptance for a certain race of people. We're talking about the culture. And if we're going to talk about culture, then we may as well get this one out of, out of the way. Are there cultures that are inherently worse than others? Yes. And if you think that that is racist or bigoted in some way, you're part of the problem. Because I'm going to go ahead and use a real-world example here, and I'm going to say African culture. Generally speaking, most people do not want to be, or do not want to have violence done to them. They don't want to be stolen from, they don't want to be hurt. Now, when we're talking about cultures, we talk about African cultures, much of Africa is still within the third world. Most of these countries are very much undeveloped. Because they are undeveloped, they struggle. Because of that struggle, because of the uncertainty and chaos down there, it means that they have most countries down there either struggle to hold or have never had a solid functional government. Now, many of them have governments. And also, many people who live under those governments will tell you about the corruption in those governments. Oftentimes, blatant and naked corruption. Most people will talk about the rampant crime. Because of the corruption, there is very little law enforcement, aside from when the corrupt leaders want the law enforced in their favor. And if you were to ask any of the people who live in those cultures... 
just the regular citizenry there. If you would ask them if it is a good or bad system that they are living in, you would have a nearly 100% rate of people saying that it is a bad system and they wish that it was better. So, should we go through and wipe out these cultures? I would argue yes. Is it possible? No. And how do I know that? Because we've tried. That goes back into the history of colonialism that I'm not going to get into, but between the US, France, Britain, Spain, however many others, who have tried to go through and colonialize um, the continent of Africa and replace their governments with a more stable one that would be more productive to them, it's always failed. It, it, you just can't fix it that way. But does that mean that we suddenly just say, well, nah, it's fine. No, we don't. We still say that it is an inferior culture there. Not the art, of course, not the music, not the dress, not these things, not the, the more expressive part of it, but the corrupt parts of it, the bad parts of it, the harmful parts of it. Yeah, those things need to be wiped out. And if there was a magic wand to just wave and wipe out corruption, is there any, pers any person in the world who would not wave that wand? So this argument here that, you know, suddenly we're, we're going to be turning Dungeons and Dragons into a genocide? No. But does that mean that we should regard these otherwise bad cultures as suddenly good? No, we also don't do that. It is not a binary. It is not one or the other. And to think that suddenly your alignment your alignment locks you into this, because this is what we're really going to get into later on. To think that your alignment has locked you into this is so grossly wrong, it's offensive. Because ironically enough, I he this person is talking about putting people into holes that they're already not in. It's a problem like it's problems like these that have led Wizards of the Coast to increasingly downplay the importance of alignment, starting with 4E and continuing into the most recent rule set, 5E, which has removed things like the alignment restrictions on classes and the innate alignments of races. As playtesting rolls on for the next update of 5E, signs seem to point to alignment finally being phased out entirely going forward, or at least turned into a vestigial optional element with no impact on gameplay or setting. We really have much to say about that one, because it is true they are working on getting rid of it. However, they're working on getting rid of it because, as I stated before, they are trying to make Dungeons and Dragons more and more accessible to anybody. Literally, pick it up and play. And that means that the more you have to think about it, the less accessible it gets. Now, removing things like alignment restrictions on classes and innate alignments of races is not actually as important as they want to make that sound. After all, if you are going to... Let's say you have a party of adventurers and they are going to be attacked by a whole bunch of orcs, okay? We've got a whole bunch of orc warriors here, and they're going to be attacking our party. Do you really think that removing their quote, chaotic evil alignment is going to suddenly make them different? Since we want to talk about things like alignment being subjective, is them attacking you not evil to you? Is that not chaotic towards you? And this is why the alignment is there. Because when you grab an NPC orc out of the bestiary and just say, I need to have seven of these... Yes, they're going to be chaotic evil. They're trying to murder you. Obviously, they're chaotic evil. But again, what if you were to go into town and go shopping and you found that the, the local butcher is an orc? Is he chaotic evil? No, he's not. Ergo... You don't really want to use the bestiary for that guy. He's a butcher, not a warrior. 
He's just going to be an NPC. He's just an orc. He's fine. Moving on. So it only makes sense that Baldur's Gate 3, based directly on 5e, has taken that step early in collaboration with Wizards of the Coast. With its aim of absurd levels of interactivity and narrative choice, the game can only benefit from not being straightjacketed by a morality system conceived 50 years ago. Because if it's 50 years old, that means it's bad. Right? After all, all old things are bad, right? Old systems are antiquated and they're bad. Old buildings are, are decrepit and they're bad. Old people are stupid and we should get rid of them. Larian is free to create its own, more nuanced story and world, and players can build whatever characters they want without being pigeonholed into certain personality types by their own mechanical choices. Thank God! I'll never need to figure out whether it's morally appropriate for my true neutral character to stack 10 explosive barrels next to an NPC before I attack them. I just... the amount of stupidity in here has actually made my argument dumber. It, it, it's like trying to run through jello. It doesn't really matter how hard you work at it, you're going to end up tired in the end because it's just going to drag you down. We are all now collectively dumber for me having read that to them, so I sincerely apologize to everybody in the chat. So why don't we talk about what alignment actually is? Right here in the D&D lore wiki, which is just, you know, regular wiki, we have the thing on alignment here, and I even brought up the picture. Here we go. Let's take a look at the picture first. Everyone likes pictures. <clears throat> So, what do we got here? We have five examples of these characters. Lawful Good. Superman, obviously. Because why? Superman is just the superhero. Period. He stands up for truth, justice, and the American way. And all those people who just say just truth and justice, screw you. It's the American way. He belongs to us. Neutral good. I actually have no idea who this person is. Wait, no. Hold on, I think I know who that is. Wait, is that the, um... Is that the guy from Firefly? I don't remember his name. I only saw Firefly once. It was a really long time ago. I think that is him, though. I'm not thinking about it anymore. But anyway. Um, yeah, if that is the guy, that that's, that's pretty much it. Chaotic Good, of course, is um, V from V for Vendetta, who is an absolute anarchist. However, he's doing it for the people. Basically, he's breaking the law for the right reasons. We'll get into that. Mal! Yes, JP's got it. Captain Mal. I think that's him. Like I said, it's been a long time. And Mal, as I recall, he was just captain of the ship. They were doing what they had to do to get by. However, he was never a person who was going to inflict harm on anybody. He didn't have to. He would literally give somebody the opportunity to make the first move before he would kill them. And there are actually words under this. Where it says, uh, see, under Mal, if I ever kill you, you'll be awake, you'll be facing me, and you'll be armed. I dare say that actually might stray a little bit closer to the lawful good than neutral good, but we'll get to that. Lawful neutral, that's basically Captain Picard. Why? Because he follows all the rules. Most of the time. Is he good? Is he evil? Eh, I would generally call him more good. However, he's really just doing his job. Captain Picard has a job to do. And that's all he does. He runs a ship... And he seeks out new, uh, new life and new civilizations. True neutral. That would be one of the Ents from the Lord of the Rings. Why? Because they're not on anybody's side. They don't care. They've been around forever. They're going to be around forever. You know, until you start killing Ents. At which point, suddenly it's their problem now. And that's when they marched on Isengard. Chaotic Neutral, Captain Jack Sparrow. JP says all the rules except for the Prime Directive and Temporal Incursions. I mean, that is fair. 
Captain Jack Sparrow, though, it says, and I love this quote, a dishonest man you can always trust to be dishonest. Honestly, it's the honest ones you have to watch out for because you can never predict when they're going to do something incredibly stupid. And that is absolutely true for a chaotic neutral character. Again, chaotic neutral characters, they're not on anybody's side. And that also includes the law side. They're basically going to do whatever they happen to feel like doing in the moment. By the way, just as a note, when you look at this chart and you ask, what is the one, the one alignment that more DMs will ban from their table than any other? Most people would immediately jump down here and say chaotic evil. That's actually wrong. Lots of DMs have no problem with a chaotic evil character. It's chaotic neutral that most DMs will not allow in their games. Because a chaotic neutral character can and will derail every single session. Doesn't matter what it is, they will derail it. Chaotic neutral, never at the table. For lawful evil, we've got Darth Vader, of course. He believes in just ruling everything through force. It's all for him. It's all for his empire. And he'll use everything available at his disposal to do it. I mean, he's trying to build an empire. He's trying to actually make things better for everybody. There is technically an argument to be made for Darth Vader to be a lawful good character. He is trying to make the galaxy better. The one thing that keeps him in lawful evil is the fact that he is willing to do whatever it takes to do so. He will slaughter an entire orphanage if it means that the Empire gets a little bit stronger. Neutral evil is the monster. And I don't just mean the monster in the fact that, you know, oh, there's a wild animal approaching our party. No. The monster. And that doesn't matter whether it's a monster like the alien or a serial killer. Because a serial killer is not necessarily chaotic evil. Evil, yes. Chaotic, no. The Joker is pictured over here. Okay, so let, let, let's look at these two independently. Some people, or some men, aren't looking for anything logical. They can't be bought, bullied, reasoned, or negotiated with. Some men just want to watch the world burn. That is absolutely chaotic evil. They are willing to just burn down and destroy everything. Why? Because it's fun for them. However, what is the Joker not? He doesn't have a plan. He doesn't care about things, really, except for having fun. He does what's enjoyable to him. But he doesn't have a plan. A neutral evil can have a plan. Which is why the neutral evil, the monster, the serial killer, if chaotic evil is the Joker, then neutral evil is Jack the Ripper. Or maybe not Jack the Ripper, because Jack the Ripper actually did have a plan. Perhaps Jack the Ripper goes over here more in a lawful evil area. But any general serial killer who's not trying to send a message is going to be neutral evil. They have their criteria they're following. They pick their victims. But they're not chaotic. They're not just going out and slaughtering. And so this is a really good example and probably why it's on the wiki in the first place. So why don't we go through this? So there's a lot on this wiki. I'm not going to read through most of it. It's not going to be like the article. I do want to cover a few things, though. The first thing is law versus chaos. Now, when they explain this, they say the law versus chaos represents opposing principles of order versus entropy, control versus chaos, society versus the individual, stability versus change, things like that. It's an okay definition, but what I like to point out is 
Law versus Chaos is basically principle versus selfishness or altruism versus selfishness. See, evil's very easy. Evil really doesn't care about anything else other than itself. And if it does care about something else, it's because it benefits itself in some way. Some people would like to say that you can't have an evil character who keeps like a puppy or something. But that's not true. That's like saying that, you know, an evil person can't have friends. That's also not true. After all, if we look at James Bond, um, one of the James Bond, I don't remember. I actually don't watch James Bond, so I can't give you the name. But there's a very famous James Bond villain who's got his pet white cat. That, that beautiful Persian. I think he was the one who said the famous line of, of when Bond said, what do you expect me to do, talk? And he's just sitting there with his cat and he says, no, I expect you to die. Of course he's got his pet cat. He loves his pet cat. Another really great example would be from anime, specifically Full Metal Alchemist. The character of Greed, whether you take it from the original um, anime or the Brotherhood anime, Greed surrounded himself with different friends. He loved his friends. However, was he evil? Yes. Did he actually care about his friends? Not really. He was greed. He wanted things. He collected things. He collected money. He collected things. He collected power. And he collected people. He cared for them the same way he cared about any other possession. Did he care about what they thought? Not really, not usually. Did he care about what they wanted? Also, no. He only, only cared about them so long as he could have them. So long as they were benefiting him. Evil can have other people and other things around it. So long as they benefit the evil character. It is literally the what can my country do for me. And of course, the opposite side of that, of course, is going to be the lawful side of what can I do for my country. Specifically, though, and I'm getting this a little bit confused. That was technically law versus evil, but law versus chaos is going to be... Actually, no, I was describing good versus evil. I've forgotten to do law versus chaos. Yeah, good versus evil. Very simply made up, it was the ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Law versus chaos instead, going backwards, got confused there. Law versus chaos is basically principles versus no principles. So really simple. A really good way to answer, is your character lawful or chaotic? Does your character keep their promises? See, a lot of people will think that law versus chaos comes to when you walk into town, do you follow the rules of the town or do you break the rules of the town? Not true. Not true in the slightest. Because what if you are a paladin? Okay. What if you're a paladin? Okay. And you are a paladin sworn to freedom. Okay. Your God is freedom. What if you walk into a town that practices slavery? Well, I mean, I suppose that if you are a paladin and you have to be lawful and the laws of this town promote slavery, I guess you better head over to the slave market and buy yourself a slave, right? Well, of course not. That's stupid. No. Lawful basically comes down to do you adhere to your own principles? Do you make a promise and follow through? Do you swear an oath and follow through? If you're a paladin who fights for freedom and you have sworn an oath to freedom, then when you walk into this town, according to your lawful nature, it should be your objective to spread freedom here. Now, does that mean that you, you start a one-man war against the entire town? Of course not. That would be stupid. A dead paladin is not going to spread freedom anywhere. Chaotic, however, does not keep their promises. They do not uphold their oaths. They don't do anything. 
Specifically, a chaotic character can, and generally will do, whatever they want to in the moment. <clears throat> and sometimes, I mean, this can be good or evil. A chaotic neutral character will generally do whatever they want to in the moment, whatever it happens to be. However, a chaotic good character tends to be like Batman. Okay, we all know Batman. Just like we know V from Vendetta. Or V from V for Vendetta. Either way, both of these characters will break the law. In order, they'll break the word of the law to uphold the spirit of the law. Batman breaks and enters. He trespasses. He assaults. He steals. Batman breaks pretty much every single law we have a law for, except for murder. And V, from V for Vendetta, murders too. He basically does all the things. They have no use for oaths, they have no use for being restrained in any way by some kind of obligation. And so this is the real boundary between lawful and chaotic. Good and evil, as I pointed out earlier, is just do you do for others or do you do for yourself? I don't really want to get too much more into that because it's also pretty obvious. Are you helping your community? Or are you hurting your community? Is it the one for all or the all for one? And just because you happen to be in the all for one category, it does not necessarily mean that you have to just go out and be this mindless, violent monster either. As I pointed out, evil characters can have people around them. You could be an evil character and still live in society. You can be an adventurer or you can be an evil NPC. Maybe you own a shop. Maybe you, you help out around the town. Why? Well, because maybe you want to rule the town someday. If you just go and burn down the town, you'll never be the leader of it. How could you? Maybe you have to be nice to people. Maybe you have to lie to them. Evil characters are consummate liars. To the point where sometimes either everybody realizes they're a liar, or, more insidiously, maybe nobody knows whether they're lying or not. Because they have to do what they have to do to make sure that everything suits them. Are they going to rob people? No, they're not going to rob people. However, if they own a tavern, maybe they water down the drinks so they can get a little bit more profit out of it. They do what they have to do to make sure they come out on top. The only difference is, are they lawful and do they play within the rules or are they chaotic and do they play outside the rules? Or are they neutral and they just do whatever they feel like they need to at the time? So let's get into this a little bit. There's a very, very short description here when it comes to the, the actual alignments. Specifically, however, this is from the 3.5 Player's Handbook. And they come with these nice little titles here. I need a drink real quick. Ah, much better. <clears throat> Kinda. Little bit. Sorta. Anyway, um... I missed several chats up here. JP says lawful evil, bad guy with guidelines. That's not untrue. Uh, Tuck says, what I go with, neutral evil is apathetic, but will do anything to enrich or empower themselves. Chaotic evil does evil for the pleasure of doing evil. Lawful evil will enact laws that favor oneself, <clears throat> or interpret laws in twisted ways in their favor. But lawful evil will still obey the written law, even if they have to violate the spirit of it. Actually, um, that last part is kind of true. 
because lawful evil will generally always stay inside the law. Specifically because they don't want to be subject to the law, after all. To be lawful evil, you have to be really, really smart. And again, this is also a problem that that does happen in, in Dungeons & Dragons. I've mentioned it to a few people, but one of the reasons why people like this are such a problem and why trying to boil down Dungeons & Dragons into this generic tabletop game doesn't work. Let's say that you want to play a wizard. Okay? And you're going to, of course, make your intelligence your best stat. This means that as a wizard, and actually, um, why don't I go ahead and pull up... No, I'm not going to bother. I'm not going to bother with that. Um, as a wizard with a high intelligence, you get a lot of things. You get things like bonus spells. Okay? Great! More spells! Everybody loves more spells. You get additional skill points to put into things. So you have better skills. Everybody loves better skills. But that's not just it. Do you know what else you get for having a high intelligence? You get to have additional languages. Okay? Which means that, technically speaking, a wizard with a... Let's just say an 18. An 18 in their intelligence. Um, human wizards... <clears throat> Well, humans in general, I do believe they speak common and they get one extra free language. Then you get to have one extra language for every point of intelligence you have over. Which means that with an 18 intelligence, you get to have four other languages. It's a total of six. Then if you put your points into linguistics, Every skill rank in linguistics you get is one more, or can get you one more language. That's a lot of languages. More than most people can comprehend. There are a few people out there who are multilingual and actually do know 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 languages. But that is an incredibly small number of the human population. We're talking like 1% of 1%. You can also be a really, really good rogue and a really smart one. Which means you can have lots of skill points to spend. You can put those skill points into things like trap finding and things like that. The problem with intelligence, however, and this has been true forever, and it's also one of the reasons why Dungeons & Dragons has traditionally been the, the game of nerds is it doesn't really matter what you have on paper. You can never make a character smarter than yourself. All of your character's thoughts, all of your character's creativity, all of the character's actions are your actions reflected through your character. And so if you cannot comprehend something, your character equally cannot comprehend it. I have one of the best examples that I've given people is you're presented with a door. Okay? You need to get through the door. And I've heard people say, well, I try to open the door. That's a good start. The door is locked. All right, I try to pick the lock. And I say, you cannot find an obvious lock. Perhaps the keyhole for the lock is on the other side of the door. And I say, huh, okay then. Um, I try to bash the door in. All right, you try to bash the door in, but the, the door is made out of heavy timbers and reinforced with iron bars. And it's like, okay, so if I can't pick the lock and I can't open the door and I can't bash the door, how do I get through the door? And see, if this is all you can think of, then your character is really limited to what you can do. But what other options do you have? Well, doors have hinges. Can you pop the pins on the hinges? Or are they pin barrel hinges? Can you lift the door up somehow and get it out of the hinges that way? 
for that matter, I just told you that the door is made out of heavy timbers. Can you set the door on fire? Can you burn the door down? Without burning down whatever building you're in. If it's a wooden door in a stone dungeon, perhaps you can do that. Alternately, have you tried knocking? After all, the best way to open a locked door is to knock. But if you are incapable of comprehending these things, then you're, you're just not going to be able to handle that. You're not going to be able to do it because your character cannot be smarter than you. The same thing is true when it comes to these alignments. Because in order to make some of these alignments work, you have to be of a sufficient intelligence to understand exactly what your, law, your alignment means for you, how to play inside of it, and how to subvert it when you need to. And we're going to start right here at Lawful Good. So it says a Lawful Good character is a protector. The iconic example of Lawful Good is the Paladin, a holy knight who protects the weak and destroys evil. So the D&D Player's Handbook provides nicknames for each of the alignments and refers to this one as the Crusader. Now, why the Crusader? Because a Paladin, or generally any Lawful Good person, has two things going for them. Number one. As we pointed out with the good versus evil, it is either all for one or one for all. The good person is the one for all type. And the lawful one has oaths that they want to maintain. They swear an oath to their god, to their principles, their virtues, their morals, and they want to spread those one for all. This is where we get the crusader. They want to spread those morals everywhere. Now, does that necessarily mean they're going to be lawfully good? And here's where I do take a little bit of an issue with both Dungeons & Dragons and Pathfinder, because I've had to struggle with this. I don't believe that every paladin has to be lawful good. I think that's stupid. What I do believe is that your paladin has to match the alignment of whatever god you're, you're following. Otherwise, how could you have paladins for a chaotic evil god? All gods have paladins, just like all gods have priests and followers. Your paladin has to at least agree with the tenets of its god. Ergo, the paladin for a chaotic evil god should be chaotic evil. But they are still bound to go through and spread those, which is why they say even a chaotic evil god should be a lawful good paladin. But that does make things very con very confusing, very quickly. But that's the general idea behind it. A lawful good person wants to spread their virtues to everyone. They are the crusader, whatever that crusade happens to be. Now, how does, how does this get very complicated? I'm going to give you a very classic example. Well, that is to say, you have a party of adventurers. You have your paladin. You have your wizard, you have your ranger, <clears throat> and your rogue. Now, how do you put a rogue who specializes in thieving in the same party as your lawful good paladin? Because if we go by what this midwit said in the, uh, the PC Gamer article, if you put a paladin together with a rogue, then surely the first thing the paladin must do is arrest the rogue, yes? <clears throat> and I apologize, my throat's a little bit rough today. So the first thing you would think is that your paladin has to arrest the rogue, which obviously is something that your paladin could do, and that would end your game pretty quickly, I think. Instead, what you have to do is you have to kind of rules lawyer this, and this is where it comes in that you can't play a character that's smarter than you. You, as a paladin, have to find a reason to both uphold your oath and keep the game going. So your oath says that you must uphold the law, you must 
punish criminals. And the rogue is obviously a criminal. There is not a single coin in that purse that the rogue has taken that belongs to that rogue. So how do you handle this? Well, there's a few ways that you could do this. However, it all, it all involves you getting really creative with your oath. That is to say, you are sworn to uphold the law. And the law says that stealing is wrong. However, it never said how you are to uphold the law. The law says that stealing is wrong, which means that technically speaking, maybe the rogue just has to give it back. So you could find out where the rogue pickpocketed all these coins from, and you could go back in the city and give them all back, after which point the punishment has been served, and the rogue is now off the hook, and you can continue on as you went before. That is one thing that we can do. Another thing that we could do is we could say that the rogue must be punished. Well, punishment could involve turning the rogue into the proper authorities and having them throw the rogue into a, a jail cell. But that's going to kind of end the game for the rogue, isn't it? What if instead, you, as the paladin, as the moral center of the party, made the rogue do penance? After all, you and the rogue will be together for a very, very very long time. And so your ability to mete out punishment over a long period of time is also going to be very, very long. So you, upon finding out that your rogue has been stealing, could do a, or force your rogue to do a penance. This could be prayer. This could be exercise. This could be odd jobs, such as polishing your armor or your sword or whatever. At any rate, as long as the rogue is punished in some way fitting the crime, you have upheld your oath, and the story continues as possible. Perhaps you don't want to do that. Instead, maybe you found out too late and you can't give the gold back. Since you cannot give the gold back to who you took it from, perhaps in the next town, you then force the rogue to donate the coins to the local church or temple or shrine or whatever it happens to be. By thinking of how to maneuver around your oath, you can uphold your oath as a paladin and you can make things work. And Tuxedo says, yeah, the rogue isn't going to want to do that. Inter-party conflict will occur. That is true. However, let us not forget that this is a role-playing game. The inter-party conflict is where the role-playing comes in. Is the rogue not going to want to do that? Of course not. He worked hard for those coins. But this is where you, playing as a paladin and the rogue playing as, or the other person playing as a rogue will butt heads and you have to come to a conclusion. What if the conclusion for this is maybe the rogue, it doesn't want to do that. So what if your, your paladin takes it into his own hands and solves the problem for the rogue? After all, since the rogue stole the coins in the first place, what if you, as the paladin, wait for the rogue to take a bath and steal the coins from him? And then, when you get to the next town, with the rogue there waiting and watching, you can then donate the coins to the local temple and say, You did a bad thing. I have now fixed the bad thing that you did. Is that going to cause even more inter-party conflict? Maybe. But here's the thing. Conflict is like fire. Sometimes it can destroy things. But sometimes fire can also be used to forge something stronger. And a good DM and good players will find a way to come out stronger for it.
Tuck says, what's more likely to happen, the Paladin will overlook the rogue's transgressions or attempt to convert the rogue, or, you know, sense evil outside the tavern conveniently. The problem with what you're thinking is that the Paladin literally cannot overlook the transgressions. That would not be lawful. Lawful says that the Paladin must. To do otherwise would not be lawful and thus would be breaking the Paladin's alignment. What it does not say is how you must address it. Now, sure, you can maybe say, well, we can overlook it this one time. But what happens the next time then? The next time then you are forced to do something. Sooner or later, you have to. The real question comes into how do you skirt the edge? One of the things that I love is in the, the Wheel of Time book series, the Aes Sedai. When one becomes Aes Sedai, they have to hold something called the Oath Rod, and they take three oaths. One of those oaths that they take is to speak no word that is untrue. And the Oath Rod literally binds them. This is something they cannot break. They literally cannot lie. However, part of their training in the White Tower for every Aes Sedai before they take the, the Oath Rod is they learn how to bend the truth. To say something that is absolutely true and also absolutely not the answer you were looking for. Which has led most people to never believe anything an Aes Sedai says. Because it is common, common knowledge that when an Aes Sedai tells you the truth, it may not be the whole truth or the truth that you want to hear. A paladin has to be very similar to that. They have an oath that they cannot break. However, how they uphold it tends to be very good. And Tuck says this is why lawful characters tend not to be taken in most campaigns. Contrary to that... I have had many lawful good characters in my campaigns, and they have all been amazing. And if Blizz is still in the chat, she's owned several of them. But let's move on a little bit. Neutral good. So a neutral good, a neutral good character believes in altruism over all else, otherwise known as the benefactor. Now, very simply, this character is often known as the Robin Hood. Because what did Robin Hood do? Robin Hood robbed from the rich to give to the poor. However, that's not all he did. If you look at the story of Robin Hood, he did a lot more than just rob rich people. Robin Hood was all over the place. As an expert marksman, he would hunt in the king's forest and he would give the food to the orphanage. He would protect villages that were being beset by raiders and thieves. Robin Hood was a man of the people, all the people, and he would do whatever it took to make sure that people were taken care of. A neutral good person just does good. They may not necessarily go looking for it, but a neutral person will do good in almost every single situation, whether it's lawful or not because they are only looking to do good. This is the kind of character that you really don't want to walk through town with. I mean, Tux was just saying that, you know, lawful character, lawful good characters tend to get a lot of, a, a lot of flack. Law, well, he says lawful in general, but lawful good characters. A neutral good character, however, will actually try to stop every single time there is something that can be done. Little old lady trying to cross the road? Wait, wait, I've got to help her cross the road. Oh, is there somebody over there who needs help carrying a box? Wait, everybody, I've got to go help them carry the box. This person is stuck in a hole? Hold on, everybody, I have to go help them get out of this hole. They're going to stop you every single time somebody needs help because they try to help everybody. And by the way, if that sounds like somebody with a psychological disorder, that's because this is the person who literally cannot stop helping everyone to their own detriment. They're literally the polar opposite of the neutral evil 
who doesn't care about K or about law or anything. They just do everything for themselves. Literally, the, the general definition of L all for me, the neutral good person will sacrifice themselves for literally any cause. They're basically looking for a reason to die. And then you have Chaotic Good, which they call Robin Hood down here. However, as I pointed out, Robin Hood did a lot more than just rob people. They say a Chaotic Good character believes in freedom as the highest virtue. The iconic example is Robin Hood, which I just rebuked, who rebels against authority as a way to protect the poor from poverty and suffering. Except Robin Hood did a lot of things just that were good. What I say is more the V for Vendetta type that we were shown, or Batman. Somebody who is willing to just buck every single law. And, and they will often look for places to break the law, believing that the law is, is keeping people from being good. They're otherwise called the Rebel. And believe it or not, I used to actually play the Rebel a lot. Because I like the idea of freedom overall. But I do find myself more in the neutral good territory lately. Or just neutral. We come down further, then we get into lawful neutral. So a lawful neutral character obeys principle as the highest virtue. For example, a judge treats all fairly and equally that would be considered lawful neutral. The alignment is even called the judge. And that is... The judge is one of the hardest alignments, I think, to play. Because a judge requires you to have basically no empathy or the ability to turn your empathy off. Because a judge can easily become turncoat on, on, its, on his own party. See, well... I stated earlier that the um, the lawful good paladin might find a way, because it is in the greater good, to keep the rogue out of jail and then still uphold their oath by making sure that the rogue pays a penance later. The lawful neutral will not do that. The lawful neutral character, as soon as they find out that the rogue has stolen something, will take the rogue straight to jail. Don't care why you did it. Don't care how you did it. Don't care when you did it. Straight to jail. Because the lawful neutral is not guided by any kind of morality, just the oath. Whatever the law happens to be. The lawful neutral character is also the character who could walk into a slave market because slavery is legal here and pick up a slave. Now, maybe they think that they're doing something good by, you know, getting this person out of here because they say, well, it's lawful for me to have a slave here. I'm going to go buy one. And then they, they can travel with their slave for a while. And if they get to another town and slavery is then illegal there, They'll say, well, damn. Spent a lot, of, a lot of gold on that slave. Look, I could have you stay out here, but we're going to be in this town for a while, so you know what? You're free. And they would just get rid of their slave because they're not really bound to it, and they also don't want to break the law in this town. Lawful neutral characters can be extremely fickle, and they can change on a dime. It's very hard. However, it can also be really fun because it does open up a lot of different opportunities for you because you can change so often. Now, maybe you don't follow the rules of the town. Maybe you have your own rules that you follow and you are absolutely strict by those. Like, for example, maybe you, you believe that stealing is absolutely wrong, which is why you sent your own rogue to jail in two towns ago. But maybe you walk into a very impoverished town, okay? And maybe you have really keen eyes. And so as you're walking through town, very, very similar to the neutral good character who has to stop and help everybody, 
maybe your lawful neutral character sees it or sees this as an opportunity to take it upon themselves to punish every single crime they see. They see somebody's cut a they see somebody cut a purse. You grab that person and take them to the uh, to the authorities. You take them to the guards. You see a child steal an apple. You grab that child and take that child to the guards. And as your neutral or your lawful neutral character moves through this impoverished town, you just keep grabbing people and taking them to the guards because crime is so prevalent. Why? Because you don't care why they're doing it. All you see is that they're breaking the law. Your law says stealing is bad. This town also says stealing is bad. You're going to punish every single thief you see. Your party would come to hate you. But it would be a very good opportunity for growth because maybe you have to find a way to change your alignment then. That's the thing. You're not locked into your alignments. Alignments can change. Now, generally speaking, they're only going to change by like one step. So maybe your lawful neutral character becomes lawful good and you learn to let some things go because they're done for the right reasons. Like maybe the cut purse needs to go to the guards. Maybe the child stealing an apple needs to eat. Lawful good. Or maybe you shift instead to just neutral. You lose the lawful part and you're just like, you know what? If, if you're not going to let me do this, then I don't care anymore. There you go. Or perhaps you could even shift one uh, step the other direction and go lawful evil and say, you know what? If nobody else, if no one else around me is going to obey the laws, maybe I'll force them to. And we have the makings of a despot here. Somebody who starts off, you know, with the best intentions, and they end off as a tyrant. So, that's true neutral. Also, I see that Flame is in the chat now. Hello, Flame. Good to see you. Uh, Flame says, Batman's insistence on to not kill people. Um, that is technically lawful. However, he's willing to break literally every single other law. He's definitely more of a chaotic good. Then we come down to true neutral. So true neutral character, neutral on both axes and cares not for any stance of alignment. This often describes someone who cares only for their own personal needs, neither inclined to hurt nor harm others, nor obey or rebel. As I stated earlier, in the article they pointed to somebody who wants to seek the balance, and this is sometimes true. Not always, but sometimes. However, generally speaking, a true neutral character just doesn't care. As long as it's not bothering them in some way, they're usually inclined to let it go. They see somebody who is cutting somebody's purse. It's not their problem. It's not their purse. They see a child stealing an apple. Well, you go, kid. Hope nobody catches you. Okay, you walk into a town and the town here says that nobody's allowed to wear yellow and you're wearing a bright yellow vest. And you're just like, you know what? It's a stupid rule. As long as nobody bothers me, I'm just going to wear my vest. You know, that that's the true neutral character. Now, that is not to say that there are some others. There are actually true neutral characters who do seek the balance. They are extremely hard to play, however, because you have to be constantly analyzing the flow of the situation and try to see where are things going. For example, a true neutral character that you would hire in a battle would be the worst kind of ally. Let's say that you're up against, your, your village is being attacked. Okay, so you've got some swords, you've got some shields, nobody has any armor, but whatever. The, the raiders are coming. So you hire a neutral band who seeks the balance. And you say, they, you say, we need your help, okay? 
And so you gather all the farmers in, you gather all the children in, you gather everybody in, okay? You've put a sword or a spear or an axe into the hands of every single man, woman, and child in this village. A village of a thousand people. Plus, you've got 300 people who are helping you out. 1,300 strong. And here comes the, the, the raiders. There's only 700 of them. You outnumber them almost two to one. Until the neutral band just says, well, this is, this is not right. We, we, we can't have this. This is, this is terribly unbalanced. And so they switch sides. So now you have a perfectly balanced battle. I mean, the true neutral character is one who would actually cripple somebody if they're too good at something. If you've ever read the book, um... Ah, uh, what was the name of the book? Uh, Brave New World. That's it. Aldous Huxley's A Brave New World. That was kind of the idea in A Brave New World, where you had a society, this utopian society, built on the idea that everybody would be more or less equal. And that meant that, you know, as they point out, if you can't make the smart people or the dumb people smarter, you're going to have to make the smart people dumber. They would tie weights to the dancers so that nobody could be better than the others. They, they would slow people down who walk too fast by adding weights to them as well. You had to bring everybody down to the lowest common denominator. It's not exactly a very popular um, stance to take. But it is one that can be done. Chaotic Neutral, otherwise known as the Free Spirit, otherwise known as Banned. A chaotic neutral character follows their heart, but without the willingness of self-sacrifice as a chaotic good character might. A great many adventure are chaotic neutral, doing what they wish and rejecting all forms of authority. Some chaotic neutral characters follow a deliberate philosophy of destroying the old to make way for the new. But more likely, they're just out for themselves and they don't really care. They just go wherever the wind takes them. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, usually it's a pain in the ass. I don't have much to say about it because there's really nothing to say about a chaotic neutral character. Because they don't plan, they don't think, they just do. As the Joker said, they are a dog chasing cars. They wouldn't know what to do if they caught one. They just do. We come to Lawful Evil. A lawful evil character is a tyrant. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. They have no moral qualms about punishing individuals for the greater goal of furthering society. A lawful evil villain is often easy to deal with as they can often be trusted to keep their word. However, as I pointed out with the lawful good character, sometimes the way they keep their word may not be the way you're thinking of. But yes, this is a character who, as was stated above in the chat, will absolutely violate the spirit of the law to uphold the letter of the law. This is a character who will keep their promises made. However, they will find a way to really skirt the edge of that promise. And they will do absolutely anything and everything in their legal power to do it. To the extent where they will, they will also go through and expand their legal power. That is to say, while they may not have the authority to do things, they will petition, they will have elections, they will, they will write things, they will do everything they can to make sure that they get more power. A great example, see they gave the example here of Darth Vader. But you know what the better example is? Chancellor Palpatine from Star Wars, who is absolutely a lawful, evil character. Darth Sidious, since before Star Wars Episode One came out. However, what did he do? In 
the series of the movies to make this very short. In the first one, he got Jar Jar Binks to call for a... Or no. Yes. He got Jar Jar Binks when Padme was away, where they're uh, Senator Amidala. He got Jar Jar Binks to call for a vote of no confidence in the current Chancellor, which gave him the opportunity to get into the Chancellorship. In the second one, the second movie, he got the authorization from them because of the war between the Republic and the Separatists to create the Grand Army of the Republic, a cloned army that had actually been in building for a long time now. And in the third movie, because the war was dragging on for so long and they were incurring such losses, they got the Senate to grant him emergency powers, which basically meant that he could now suspend the Constitution of the Republic to do whatever it took to finish the war. And by the time he got that, even the Jedi were like, um, yeah, this is bad. And what happened? The Jedi were really worried that after the war ended, he wouldn't give up his powers. Turns out, they were right. He had the emergency powers, he had the army, he had everything he needed. At which point, he just simply pulled the trigger on the plan that he had going the entire time, wiped out the Jedi, and became the new Emperor of the... Em the em yeah, the Emperor of the Empire after he, with his emergency powers, restructured the entire Republic and disbanded the Senate. Why? Because those were in his powers to do. He followed all the laws. And he, he gained absolute power because of it. Now, he had to change the rules to suit him. But he still stayed within those rules even as they changed. That is lawful evil. Again, a lawful evil character is one that really needs you to be really smart. Because you got to find all kinds of loopholes. Now, a neutral evil character is selfish and has no problem harming others to get what they want, if they can get away with it. Absolutely. So while many people have called chaotic evil chaotic stupid, Neutral evil is very much not stupid. As a matter of fact, neutral evil may be best described as the evil genius. I mentioned serial killers earlier. Why? Because serial killers have to plan things. Everything has to be meticulously or ordered in order for them to get what they want. But the same thing would also be true for anybody who is a professional criminal. Anybody who is a mobster who wants to run a successful business, whether that be gambling, racketeering, extortion, or just running the black market. I mean, the black market is by definition neutral evil. It exists outside the law. They're in it for themselves. They can charge whatever they want. They are ripping somebody off no matter how they do it whether they are stealing their supplies to sell to somebody else, or they're overcharging for something, or they're breaking the laws to get it, although that would be more chaotic than evil, it still kind of falls in that category. And then, of course, we have chaotic evil. One of the harder ones to play, because most people don't understand it. The chaotic evil character is malevolent. A villain bent on revenge might be of this alignment, where the most powerful lawful evil villains might aim to conquer the world. This might be preferable to their chaotic evil counterparts who would just destroy it. And I mean, that is true. As they pointed out in the picture, some men just want to watch the world burn. Your villain with a, a, a world-destroying death ray would be considered chaotic evil. Give me stuff, or I blow up the world. Despite the fact that you are, in fact, standing on the world. Chaotic evil characters generally do what they do without any sense of real self-preservation. 
They just do what they want because it feels good to them at the moment. And they really do not care about the consequences of it. Which is the real key when it comes to a chaotic evil. They don't care about anything. They don't care about good. They don't care about evil. They don't care about law. They don't care about freedom. They don't care about justice. They don't care about morals, virtues. They don't care. Now, is this to say that they are just a, a bull in a china shop? That they're just going to be rampaging across the world? No, obviously not. Even chaotic, char chaotic evil characters have to sleep sometimes. And a chaotic evil character is going to get hungry sometimes. A chaotic evil character is going to get hungry and are they going to say, well, uh, maybe I should go to the store? No, a chaotic evil character is going to say, I'm hungry. I'm going to get whatever food I can as fast as I can, and I don't care. Does that mean that I'm going to take it from my party? Maybe. Does it mean that I'm going to go take it from the food stand down the way? Maybe. Does it mean that I will literally take this, this apple out of this child's hands? Maybe. I mean, maybe your, your, um, your neutral good character saw the child steal an apple and your, your neutral good character, or maybe your lawful good character is just like, it's wrong, but I'm not going to stop a hungry child from stealing an apple. The chaotic evil character in the party might then walk up to the character or the child, take the apple and say, well, child's hungry, so am I, chomp. Because that's what chaotic evil does. It doesn't care that the child stole it. It doesn't care that the child is hungry. It just doesn't care. And it will do whatever it wants. This is actually one of the reasons why the chaotic evil character is sometimes called the chaotic stupid character. Because many people will take that I don't care to a gross extent. They'll say I don't care what happens? And so they'll drop Trow and take a shit in front of the guards. Well, that's just stupid. Why would your chaotic evil character do that? I mean, unless your character or chaotic evil character is looking for a fight. You say, it's been like three sessions since we've been in a good fight. If we leave this city without me getting into... A, a fight, I'm going to lose my mind. I don't care who it's with. I don't care who wins or loses. I need a fight. And so then maybe your chaotic evil character drops Trow, takes the shit in front of a guard, and the guard's like, you're under arrest. And your chaotic evil character's just like, oh, am I? I hope you don't mind if I resist. Uh, Flame says the, oh, I think that was for the lawful evil. In exchange for X, I want you to give me back my sister, then proceeds to give them their sister, but crippled and mute. I mean, that would be cruel and sadistic, but not out of, out of character for a lawful evil character. And then for chaotic evil, Flame just says unpredictable. And yes, unpredictable is absolutely a word for a chaotic evil character. What most people fail to do, though, is they take it to the extreme and then that's where the chaotic stupid comes in they say my character's unpredictable i'm going to light this building on fire now it's like but but why what does your character get out of lighting that on fire now if your character's a pyromaniac then sure oh tux has got a good comment there Tuck says the Joker from the Dark Knight is the quintessential chaotic evil character. Everything he did was smart. Yes! Why? Let's go through the Dark Knight. First thing to happen in the movie, bank robbery. Why did he rob the bank? He needs the money. And it was fun. He had fun doing it. Also, what bank did he pick? It was a mob bank. They had their own private security, they had an electrified vault, and they were packing shotguns under the desks. It's a mob bank. 
Why did he pick that and not, you know, Wells Fargo? Because it's fun. After that, he went to the, uh, the mobsters themselves. And he's like, we were all having fun, right? Why did we stop having fun? The Batman? Okay, fine. Let's kill the Batman. And then he proceeded to spend the rest of the money trying to kill Batman. Why? It was fun. He laid traps. He gave puzzles. Everything he did was cold and calculated. And why? Because in the end, it was good for him. So Tux is right. Quintessential chaotic evil. But not stupid. And then, of course, there is the um, the unaligned, which, you know, that's just you don't have an alignment. You don't have thought. Um, then if we go down further, there's the five alignment systems that started back with um, the basic in, in 1977. Sure. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons fourth edition introduced the five alignment system. This has um, good, lawful, good, evil, chaotic, evil, and then just unaligned. Which is stupid, because as we've explained, you just removed a whole bunch of different things. I mean, this is basically saying that chaotic good and neutral good are the same thing. Really? Chaotic good and neutral good are the same thing. As I already explained, the benefactor is basically that terminally giving person, okay? Okay. The one who literally cannot stop themselves from giving. They have a mental disorder. They're literally killing themselves with it. You could also call this person the martyr. Because this is a person who is literally looking to die. Way different from the chaotic good. And down here, they've got um, chaotic, or let's see. Yeah, just evil and chaotic evil. Meaning that you have to then combine lawful and neutral evil. So your tyrant and your just generally selfish person are now combined into one person. This is stupid. And now Dungeons & Dragons 5e is adopting the same thing. They haven't mentioned it in here. But this... Yeah, this is just dumb. So 5e is adopting this, and pretty soon they say that um, 5e is going to just get rid of alignment entirely. They're going to make the alignment basically the same as your character description. So your character is going to have brown hair, blue eyes, they're going to be 5 foot 7, they're going to weigh about 160 pounds, and they're going to be chaotic neutral. You have just lost so much of your character when you took away the alignment. But they're doing it because, as I've just, ex I just spent two hours explaining this, there is so much richness and so much depth in the alignment of your character, not just in how you see your character and how your character sees the world, but how to structure your decisions and how to really make your character all the more complex because of it. As I stated with a lawful good character, lawful good is always seen as the goody goody two shoes can't do anything wrong, except that a lawful good character can do things wrong if they justify them. I want to go back to this article before I sign off of here and I want to talk about what they said about the, um, where was it? Uh, let's see. Where was that stupid argument? I can't find it now. I think I went down too far. Ah, no, here it was. So, let's see. Ah, here it is. So, arguments, here we go. There's the beginning of the sentence. So, it's led to decades of idiotic arguments about the ethics of fantasy worlds. D&D's version of would you go back in time to kill Hitler as a baby is it becomes 
is it lawful good for a paladin to kill a chaotic evil baby orc? Tuxedo says, to be fair, removing alignments is preferable to over or preferable over applying them incorrectly, but still kind of dumb. I partially agree. However, that's a bit like saying you have a child and your child is struggling to learn math. Well, just not teach your child math at all then. After all, we would want your child to struggle, right? It's not, it's not kind of dumb. It's insultingly dumb. It's literally saying, rather than you grow as a person, we're just going to take away the challenge. But right here, it says, is it lawful good for a paladin to kill a chaotic evil baby orc? As I stated before, individuals do not have to be chaotic evil. The orcish culture is chaotic evil. And until it changes, because alignments can change, but so long as orc culture is primarily about raiding and pillaging, it will be chaotic evil. But is it lawful good to kill a baby? No. No, it is not. Do you know what it would be good for the paladin to do? Let's say that your paladin happens to find an orc baby. Now, the paladin, of course, cannot necessarily take care of a baby, especially not an orc baby. Because if you bring the orc baby into the temple, what kind of life is it going to have? It's going to be sequestered underneath the temple. No one's going to be allowed to see it. It's bad. So here's what the, the paladin does instead. The paladin takes the baby and delivers it to an orc tribe. So now the baby can be raised by orcs. But maybe your lawful good paladin sticks around. Maybe as, you, as the baby is growing up, maybe when the baby starts teething, your paladin starts putting points into sneak or rather stealth so that your paladin in the middle of the night can then sneak into the orc encampment and maybe the, your paladin leaves a holy symbol in the baby's crib. And when the orc parents wake up in the morning, they find this baby orc teething on the symbol for Helm. Maybe as it grows older, you start teaching it little things here and there. You sneak in and you leave it a copy of your holy text. Eh, maybe a simplified version. Maybe you teach it how to read. Maybe as it gets older and it starts exploring, you can meet up with this baby orc on the outskirts of the territory and give it lessons. Maybe you do everything you can to help guide this this baby orc as it grows, and maybe it doesn't grow up to be a chaotic evil raider. Maybe it grows up to become more of a leader in the community. You teach it virtues like strength, individualism. And maybe by teaching this one orc, and doing so under the nose of the entire tribe, maybe you even get the rogue to help you out with this one since he already knows how to sneak. After all, if he can steal coin purses off of people walking through the market, he can help you sneak into an orc village, right? You help guide this baby over time. And now, not only do you have this orc, this baby orc, who is maybe not lawful good, but maybe neutral good? Maybe chaotic good. But either way, you have made a difference here. It's long term. It's not going to have this immediate gratification that people are looking for. It would take time. It would take thought. Things that people just don't seem suited for these days, especially midwits like this, who think they know better than everybody else, but really don't have a clue at all. Tux says you could justify killing an orc baby. It would not be a good aligned decision, but mid war. Killing it could be viewed as more merciful over abandoning it in the wild. Well, I do agree with that. The fact is that a lawful good character would never make that decision. 
a, a lawful good character would, if they could not return it, a lawful good character would would take it back with them if they had to. If they could not deliver it to its own people, they would take it with them. A neutral good character, the benefactor or the martyr, would absolutely take it back with them because they would feel obligated to help it. The chaotic good character would probably kill it because they wouldn't really have any kind of oath making them do it, but the good part of them would probably say, if I don't kill it, then the very least I can do is take it back where it came from. A Kata character probably would not adopt it. So, whereas the, um, the benefactor would absolutely adopt, and the lawful good would probably adopt, the chaotic good would probably return. And just say, look, I'm not going to kill it, but I'm also not going to raise it. I'm just going to send it back. It's not my problem. I mean, the lawful neutral character would kill it 10 out of 10 times. I mean, there's, there's no question there. A lawful neutral is killing the baby. Chaotic neutral? I don't know. Chaotic neutral might keep it. But if the chaotic neutral was to keep it, they might also keep it as a pet. So you got to be kind of careful with that. And the true neutral character would just leave it there. The lawful um, evil character would absolutely take it 10 out of 10 times. However, the lawful evil character would raise that child to be a tool. And that's probably all it would ever be, is a tool to them. I'm trying to think of a good example. I can't... I can't think of one that comes to mind immediately. No, I don't have anything. Um, the neutral evil might actually decide to just kill the baby themselves for the fun of it. Like, actually torture the baby. And the chaotic evil character would probably play with the baby until it died. Because it's fun. I mean, the chaotic evil character is absolutely not going to leave the baby alone. They want the baby. They're going to have fun with the baby. And they're going to break the baby in the process. Which is also going to be fun. So you, gotta, you, you, you can take these alignments, you can go so many different ways with them. There is so much richness in this. And they're trying to strip all of it out. Now, is it possible that you can still have this without the, um, the alignment system? This is the, one th this is the one time where I am actually going to give this person a little bit of a pass. Because even if we get rid of this system, it doesn't necessarily mean that the characters have to change. After all, we have had nuance like this in characters ever since the beginning, way back in 1977, when we only had the five. And that was just lawful good, lawful evil, neutral, chaotic good, chaotic evil. That was it. But we could still have nuanced characters then. And we can now, even if they remove it. They can't take that away. Because that's uh, that's really the crux of it. These people would love to have a stranglehold over the game and say, you have to play the game that or you have to play the game the way I want you to play it. Truth is you don't have to. It's our game, not theirs. They might write they might have written the books. They might have made the dice, they might have printed the maps, but it's our game, and we can play it the way we want to play it. And that means that when people like this come out and say that we're doing it wrong, or that the system is bad because they disagree with it, yeah, that's fine. You can go play by yourself. We don't have to, uh, we, we don't have to listen to you. In fact, we can actually ostracize you. We can say, look, you can play by your rules, and you can play over there. 
And you know what? When you get tired of playing by yourself or with all those other people around you who do nothing but complain, if you can agree to play by our rules, maybe you can come back and play with us. And we'll teach you how to have fun with it. But until these people are ready to, you know, actually bite the bullet and accept a little bit of humble pie, that's never going to happen. But now, hopefully, you have a better understanding of the alignment system and just what it brings to tabletop gaming. Not just what it brings to tabletop gaming, though, but also how does it work, what does it mean, how do you apply it, and how can you be a better player for not only taking your alignment, but finding out how to maneuver around it. And also, think about maybe what kind of alignment you are secretly at home. Are you the neutral good person who does nothing but give? And is your mental uh, state deteriorating because of it? Or do you have maybe some shades of that, that neutral evil person and you find yourself taking more from others than you ever give? Do you find yourself being the stickler for rules? Or are you more of that free spirit who just kind of does whatever you feel like? I don't know. Think about it yourself. Don't, don't go online and take a stupid little quiz. Really do some introspection on that one. Think about what kind of person you are. And I've got a couple more chats, then we're going to get out of here. So, Flame said the law varies. It sure does. And then just says proceeds to use the old system anyway. Yeah, it is kind of funny to say... We're, we're, we don't want to use this old system. They're, in fact, going back to the older system. Tuck says, uh, We had nuance like this in characters ever since we had characters in stories before D&D &D existed. D&D &D just put a name to it. D&D &D, um, was interactive, though. The stories weren't. We did have lots of stories with lots of good characters, but D&D &D said, Here's how we can make interactive stories. That made it better. Tux also says D&D is for everyone, unless you play in a way we don't like. In that case, you must change the game in a way we like or not play. And that is absolutely where Dungeons & Dragons is right now. It is also why Wizards of the Coast is bleeding right now. They are bleeding money. They are bleeding players. The only thing keeping them afloat so far is the fact that D&D &D is the biggest tabletop game and so, if, if smaller games like Call of Cthulhu were to lose a million people, Call of Cthulhu wouldn't even exist. If Dungeons & Dragons lost a million people, it would still have several million more to go before it hits rock bottom. But never you forget, they are bleeding people, and they will hit rock bottom eventually. It's just going to take them longer to get there. Flame says, I... Luckily, D&D &D also isn't the only game of its kind. No, it is not. Pathfinder is great. I love Pathfinder 1. I have not yet explored Pathfinder 2, though. I heard that Pathfinder 2 really took a lot of cues from 5e, and that does not make me confident. And Tuck says, because playing in a way that makes us not want to play is the equivalent of not letting us play, apparently. Yeah, basically. It's, it's either my way or the highway. Unless you disagree, in which case you need to change for me. It's selfishness, it's narcissism, it's greed, it's everything that is wrong with the progressive left movement right now in politics and in culture. And on the cultural front, this is what it's doing. This entire thing right here is what it's doing. And this is a prime example. This is why I do my Sunday lectures on things like like culture. And Tuck says, you've convinced me to continue working on my D&D &D system today. There may be an opening in the market soon. There may be. You keep working on that. And you know what? When it's finished, let me know. Because if there's a chance to showcase it, I might be able to do that for you. Anyway, though, I'm going to go ahead and get out of here. We've already been at this for two and a half hours. My throat hurts. I'm not generally a talky person, so... <laughs> All these uh, these lectures, they really make my throat raw. But that's okay. Um, Speaking of tabletop games, 
tomorrow we are going back to work on the Final Fantasy module. We've got started on the Espers. Last week we did Moogle and Shiva. Tomorrow we are doing um, Ifrit and Rama at a minimum. We may do more if we um, if we can fit them in time. Now that we've got the template made and we've got a lot of the stuff worked out, it may go a lot faster. So Ifrit and Rama for a start, possibly more. If you're interested, be there. If you're not interested, then at least subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon, that way you get notified every time the videos come out. If you enjoyed this discussion on tabletop alignment, specifically Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder, but it applies to other things. If you enjoyed this, share this video with anybody you think might want to see it, hear it, listen to it, whatever. But otherwise, do me a favor, leave a like on the video, leave some comments down below. I'll read your comments, I'll answer your comments, join the Discord. You can comment at me there and I can respond in real time. Otherwise, though, I will see you next week for, I think, well, no, maybe next week. I gotta see what's going on next weekend, so I'm not positive on that one. Maybe next next week for the lecture. Till then, take care. <laughs>